Welcome to Real Bible. In each Real Bible segment, we'll strive to tackle real truth from a real book applied to real life. I'm Carol Salee, and this is produced by The Salee Group. In this 10-week session of Real Bible, I'll be presenting Life Song, a study of Psalms. Life Song will consist of 10 segments of Bible teaching in which we focus on a different type of Psalm. If you missed the introductory segment last week, you may want to catch that video. It will help this series make so much more sense. These are going to run 40 to 45 minutes, so if you don't have much time, just watch it in 10-15 minute time increments. That's the beauty of timestamp. Or just settle in and spend the whole time with me. Well, part of what we're going to do in Real Bible is get equipped in how to study the Bible for ourselves. All you'll need for this time is your Bible and whatever you might want to take notes. I will say that there will be some handouts provided, and I'm learning how to do that. Right now, it may just be handouts in the comments or in a link below, but I'm learning how to do Google Docs so that that's something that you could just go and get at your leisure. I can tell you this is a very simple production. Real is in the title, and real is what you'll get. So let's get going in segment two of Life Song. This is going to be about enthronement psalms, and I'm calling this Awed by a King. And a brief description of what an enthronement psalm is would be this. They describe God's majesty and sovereign rule over his creation and his providential care by which he sustains controls and directs all he has made. I have an unusual collection, and it is a collection of sunsets. Now, this is not the sunset that I'm going to be talking about today. This was a picture of a sunset that my daughter and I were able to share together. My husband, Phil, and I, we've been in ministry for about 42 years and have had the privilege of serving at several churches. Well, one of the churches at which we served was in the Denver, Colorado area. We loved Colorado and pictured ourselves doing ministry there for the rest of our days. But family responsibilities brought us back to Oklahoma. We didn't get to go to Colorado for about two years, and I was so homesick for that place. But we decided we were going to save up our money, and we were going to go on a family vacation to Breckenridge, Colorado, one of my favorite places on the planet. Well, as soon as we got there and I saw the Rocky Mountains, I realized how homesick I was, and I got a little out of sorts because of the strength of the emotions I was feeling. So we kind of got the kids settled in and I told Phil, I just need to go by myself for a walk. So I left our condo and I'm kind of meandering down through Breckenridge, has the greatest little town that you can go into. And I noticed this white translucent tent and I get to listening. The Breckenridge Orchestra is in there and they are playing the theme from Star Wars. So I think I just have to set and take this in. I look around and I see the river that runs through Breckenridge and it's like there's this God-made amphitheater that's right on the side of this river. So I go and I set beside this river and I'm listening to the sound of music that God put into the heart of mankind, and I'm listening to the sound of the river, the music that God put there. And I look up at the Rocky Mountains, and they still have some snow on the top, but it's beginning to melt down, so the river is really rushing. So I sat there in my homesickness and my longing for this place, and I watched as the sun beautifully set on top of those Colorado Rockies, and I sat there until it went dark. I just had this inclination in my spirit at the end of watching that sunset that God was saying, I did this one for you. And I was overwhelmed by his glory and his grace toward me in that moment. That's a little bit of what we'll be encountering today whenever we study enthronement psalms. Now, there are enthronement psalms and there are royal psalms, but they're different. Royal psalms really focus on a king, and it could be an earthly king like King David, or it could be the heavenly king, or it could be the coming messianic king. But enthronement psalms, they are all about God. If you will take some time to look at the various enthronement psalms, you'll see that they are filled with God's unique names. 
They say names like Lord, Lord our God, God, God of glory, the Most High, King, Lord on high, God of Abraham. And I do want to remind you that anytime you see a reference to the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, that is a significant moment in Scripture. In Genesis chapter 12, God showed up in the life of Abraham and he called Abraham into a personal relationship with him. And God made a covenant with Abraham that could be called a triad covenant. And it had to do with blessings, land, and descendants. And he said, Abraham, I'm going to give you this land. I'm going to make you into a great nation. I'm going to bless you and all people will be blessed through you. So when you're reading something like an enthronement psalm and you see God of Abraham, God of Jacob, that represents all the hopes, dreams, promises, covenants, prophecies that God made in the Old Testament that we're still living with today. So his unique names are there, his created world and his control over it are mentioned. God's qualities are throughout, qualities like powerful, sovereign, holy, majestic, unchanging. God's people are mentioned and how they are to approach him and worship him. One of the things that we need to get straight as we go into enthronement psalms is we have polytheism and then we have monotheism. The Canaanites that were at the time that the Bible was being written and the children of Israel were interacting, they were polytheistic. Ancient people believed there was a relationship, a relationship between their land and their gods. And their gods owned territory and then allotted it to human rulers of their choosing. So cities were tied to specific deities. And it was common to build a special house for the deity associated with your city. Well, that may sound familiar to scripture when we think about God being associated with Israel, associated with Jerusalem, and associated with the temple. So while today, as a modern day believer, I believe there's only one true God, we have to understand contextually that the children of Israel were constantly being confronted with other gods. Polytheism was there. And so the Canaanites had many gods, but the God that the Israelites served was requiring that they serve and worship and obey only him. So mono, monotheism is a vital part of the Old Testament and the New Testament down to the modern day believer. But the children of Israel, the Hebrews at this time, they would have had to say no to the gods that were being offered to them and say, we're only going to focus here. So throughout the Psalms, you will see mention to gods in plural with a little g, and that's why. The Israelites were still developing their monotheistic faith, and it took a lot of training, a lot of discipline. Um, it took a long road for them to get to that place where they were really going to just follow God as their one and only true God. So today we're going to take the time to look at briefly at five enthronement psalms. And if you're taking notes, here's the outline. Here's getting us started. When we are awed by the king when we are awed by the king. And we'll look at Psalms 29. When we are awed by the king, here's the first one, we glorify him. Now, if you're watching the video and you have your Bible in hand, you may want to stop it for a second and just read quickly through Psalms 29. Because my time is a little bit limited, I'm not going to take the time to read every verse. Instead, it'll just be kind of referring to some of the things that are contained in Psalms 29. Well, I do want you to notice in Psalms 29 verse 1, it says, Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. The word glory means weighty importance. Now, God is full of his glory. It doesn't have anything to do with what I would give to him. But when it's commanded, ascribe to the Lord glory, that means that I'm going to give God the weight and the honor that is due to him. I'm going to recognize who he is and his importance. So the first thing when we're awed by a king is we glorify him. Well, this Psalm, Psalm 29, teaches us why he's worthy 
of being glorified by those who believe in him. Verse 2 says that he is holy. Now, holiness has to do with the complete perfection of God's attributes that set him apart from any other being. And this verse speaks of the Lord in the splendor of holiness. So imagine that at this time, the kings of that day, you could tell who the king was by how he was dressed and how he carried himself. Let me give you an example. I used to work for my sister, and she has a very successful meeting planning and and conference planning business. And I worked for her in her home. And most days when we weren't going to see any of her clients, she and I came to work maybe with our hair done, maybe with makeup on, definitely in sweatpants. But occasionally I would be sitting and working at my desk and I would hear coming down the hall, my sister walking in her high heels. And when I would hear her high heels clicking on the tile, I would shout, important shoes, important shoes, because I knew based on the way that she was dressed that she was about to go out and have an important meeting. Whenever it talks about giving God glory because he's holy, it's as if we look at how he has dressed, his carriage of himself, and we shout, important God, important God. So that's the first way that we give him glory. The first reason why we give him glory is because we know that he is holy. Then in verses 3 through 9 of this particular psalm, we see that we give God glory because he is powerful. And what I love about the way the psalmist put this particular song together, it's as if the psalmist is surveying God's world and seeing him in the midst of it and then hearing God's voice as he controls it. The psalmist gives this description that God's voice is over many waters. The psalmist is imagining that God is in control and limiting of the chaotic waters from creation. He's in control of the flood. He's in control of the storms. The psalmist also said that God's voice is powerful. His voice thunders and causes the earth to shake. When I was a fairly new Christian living in Oklahoma, and if you haven't lived in Oklahoma, Oklahoma has amazing thunderstorms. Well, I was a new Christian and and I'm anticipating the relationship that I have with God on the planet, the relationship I'm going to have with him in his heavenly kingdom. I happened to be taking a shower and it was the biggest thunderclap of my life. And it shook the house. It shook the walls of the bathroom that I was in. And this thought went through my mind. Jesus is coming back and I'm naked. And all I can say is maybe that's why we go in the twinkling of an eye. But I was having a moment when I was ascribing God glory because of his voice in the thunder. The psalmist also says that the voice of God is full of majesty. In verse 5 and 6 of this psalm, it says that the voice of God breaks the cedars of Lebanon. His voice is so powerful that it can break the largest and strongest trees in the region. These are the trees that were used to build the temple. And he breaks them, and it's as if they go skittering about like a calf in a new field. That's how powerful the voice of God is. It says that God's voice flashes forth flames of fire makes the deer give birth, and strips the forest bare. That's just his voice and his creation. So we can give God glory because he's holy, because he's powerful. He's also enthroned. And if you read this psalm in its entirety, it's almost as if the psalmist is picturing God coming out over the water, up over the mountains, and finally into the temple. And he comes into the temple with shouts of glory surrounding him. It says in verse 10 that God now sits enthroned. He sits enthroned as king forever. He's ruling over everything he has made. And so sitting indicates his authority and his glory. It's as if the king has come down through the worshipers and now he sets before them and they can begin to approach him. So we give God glory because he's holy, he's powerful, he's enthroned, he's sovereign. He possesses all power and is the ruler of all things. The Holman Commentary on Psalms says this, The sovereignty of God is the most basic underlying truth of all biblical theology. God is God. He does as he pleases, when he pleases, where he pleases, how he pleases, with whom he pleases. 
And this Psalms breaks down God's sovereignty. Verses 1 and 2 speak of God's sovereignty over heaven, where angelic beings worship the greatness of God. And if you go and look and see some of what those heavenly beings say is holy, holy, holy. Interestingly, the Greek did not have what we have in English, the good, better, best. And so the repetition of three was showing that it was preeminent. It was the most. Or in modern day, it was the goat, the greatest of all time. So to say God is holy, holy, holy is saying he's good, better, best. An example might be, and I know if I step into the realm of sports, someone's not going to like the example. So imagine your favorite athlete and you describing that athlete and saying, fill in the blank, is player, player, player. You're, seeing, you're saying good, better, best. It's absolutely at the top. That's what heaven spends its days doing. Well, God is also sovereign over the earth, and it's evidenced by his creation and his control over the forces of creation. Verse 11 tells us that God is sovereign over people. He's, set, he's setting enthroned, and having assumed his rightful place as eternal king, he becomes the source of confident hope for his people. Verse 11 talks about God giving us peace and God giving strength to us, even in life storms, even whenever the trees break and the water goes chaotic. Even in that, God gives us peace and he gives us strength. Now, peace involves a sense of security that comes with wholeness or completeness, a confident awareness that all is well. I would tell you that peace doesn't come with having the answers, but from giving the situation to God. I mentioned that we lived in Oklahoma. Well, part of living in Oklahoma is tornado preparedness. And everyone in Oklahoma has a designated Frady hole, we call it, a Frady hole. And within our Frady hole in our home, when we lived in Oklahoma, it was a coat closet in the center of our home. And in that Frady hole, in case a tornado came, I had a tub. And in the tub were all the essentials that we would need if a tornado actually hit our house. I had a crank radio, money, a Bible, a lighter, deodorant, toothpaste, and chocolate. Because I tell you, if we're going down, we're going down with chocolate in our bellies. So imagine this. The tornado sirens are going off. We tell our children, we have to come into the Frady Hole. We gather our children from all over the house, the little Salee family. We close ourselves into the tornado shelter. Now, here's a silly question. Did the intensity of the storm immediately decrease because we were in our safe space? No, the storm still raged. What was different was that we were tucked in to our safe space. That's the kind of peace that God gives us. We have this storm raging in our life. It's thunder. It's lightning. It's, it's big what is going on. We tuck ourselves into God, into his protection. It still rages. But we're different because we have come into that place where he gives us peace. He also gives us strength. I want to read a couple of Bible verses to you that have become meaningful to me. Deuteronomy 20 verse 1 says this, When you go to war against your enemies and see horses and chariots and an army greater than yours, do not be afraid of them because the Lord your God will be with you. Here's another one from Isaiah chapter 43 verse 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. That last scripture passage from Isaiah 43 really came alive to me. Many years ago, I was getting ready to go to a women's event. And the city in which we lived was prone to flooding. We lived on a little narrow country road. And it is a downpour. But I have to get myself to the church to get us ready for this women's event. So I get in our passenger van. Yes, we had those years. I get into our passenger van and I'm heading down the country road and I stop because it looks pretty deep and the water really seems to be rushing over the road and down into a gully. But I have something to accomplish. So I think I'm just going to go for it. 
and I go into the water and realize immediately the mistake I have made. Should never drive into rushing water and my van is floating and I can hear things bumping up under my van. Well, all of a sudden my van high centers on a place in the road and I pick up my cell phone and I call Phil. I am floating. I am floating. I've done the stupidest thing. I have gotten myself into this water. You have to come and get me out. And I'm really getting panicky in this situation because I'm imagining my van going on down into that gully and I'm going to have to jump through the sunroof and grab hold of a tree and people from the church could be driving by that day and see their pastor's wife up in that tree having made the most ridiculous choice of my life. And that verse from Isaiah 43 came to my mind. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. And I felt this peace and this strength come in me, and I said, okay, I'm just going to be at peace, and I'm going to rely on the strength of God in this situation. I'm happy to tell you that my husband and a couple men of the church were able to drag me out of that rushing water, and I made it to the church on time for the women's event. Verse 1 of this psalm says, ascribe glory. And then in verse 9, it shows being saying glory. Here's a quote from the NIV commentary on Psalms. When we really see God as he is, when his power and holiness is displayed for us, there should be no other appropriate response but to get on our knees and acknowledgement of just how far our lives are removed from the holiness of God and just how undeserved is the gracious love and salvation that God pours out on us day by day. All we can do is bow in worship, and say glory. Let's go to our next enthronement psalm, Psalms 47. You may want to stop the video now and just quickly read Psalms 47 so you'll have a better understanding of where we're going. I do want to remind you that in verse 4 of Psalms 47 and in verse 9 of Psalms 47, we see references to Jacob and we see references to Abraham. I just mentioned that a few minutes ago. Anytime you see those mentions of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that's the covenant, the hopes, dreams, promises, the promises, the, the prophecies fulfilled. So always take note when you see those three particular names. Well, in verse 2 of Psalms 47, it says, For the Lord the Most High is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. Our second point for this particular segment is when we are awed by the king, we fear him. Now, fear of God, to me, is one of the most challenging concepts to explain. Fear of God can be anxious dread. It's, it's the realization of God's impending judgment on our sin. I might liken it to back in the day when my husband Phil was a little boy, both of his parents sang in the choir. So Phil would sit kind of on the front row by himself. So his parents are up in the choir and they can see him down on the front row and he's not behaving like he's supposed to. And they're doing all the stink eye that they can, but they cannot get him to behave. So on the way home in the car, his dad told him, Phil, when we get home, I'm gonna give you a spanking. This was back when it was okay to give your kids a spanking. Well, anxious dread overcame five-year-old Phil. So he went in and he put on five or six pairs of underwear. And he said when his dad came in to spank him, it made this incredibly fluffy sound. That's anxious dread. As believers in God through Jesus Christ, we have been delivered from that kind of fear. The fear that is being presented to us in this particular psalm, has to do with reverence, awe, respect. We are delivered from the wrath of God, but not the discipline of God. And Paul wrote in Philippians 2.12, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Here's a silly little story to kind of give you an idea what I mean about this healthy respect and, and reverence that we should have for God. I broke a cardinal rule of mine that I was going to go with our church youth group to a water park, which means I'm going to need to be in my swimsuit 
in front of church people because I'm going to take my daughter Jill. And I have never looked great in a swimsuit, but I definitely didn't look great in my swimsuit on this particular day, but I want her to be able to have this experience. Well, Jill, my friend Martha and I, we get into the wave pool. If you've never been in a wave pool, it simulates what it's like not really, but close enough, if you've never been to the ocean, what it would be like to have those waves keep coming over you. Well, I'm really buoyant and a good swimmer, so I decide I'm going to do the wave pool without a flotation device. The bell rings, the waves start, and the first one hits me, and I realize immediately I am in so much trouble. And I start looking around for a lifeguard because I think I'm going to have to call out for help. And I notice one over here who's talking to two 16-year-olds who do look good in their swimsuit and realize he's probably not going to pay attention to me or be much help to me. Well, my little tiny 10-year-old Jill, she swims over to me and shouts, Mom, get on my inner tube. Well, I come up out of the water like Orca the whale, and I land on Jill's inner tube, and I catapult my little 10-year-old into these waters. Well, I cannot let this happen to her, so I reach over, and I grab her by the back of her swimsuit, giving her the biggest and wettest wedgie of her life, and I manage to get her on her inner tube. But it's getting into dire circumstances for me. My friend Martha notices what is going on and she grabs an inner tube and shoves it over to me. And my plan is to go under the water and come out and just rest in this inner tube. Well, what Martha and I don't know is it's a very small, small child size inner tube. So when I go and I come at, it goes like this. It wedges my hands against my face, and I am stuck in this inner tube. And I have to spend the next five minutes in those unrelenting waves, just riding it out. If I ever am brave enough to get in my swimsuit again in front of church members and go to the wave pool, I can promise you there will be a flotation device firmly planted around my buoyant hips. I've been swimming so many times since then. I've been in the ocean since then. I'm not so dreading of the water that I won't go in it, but I have a new awe, I have a new reverence, I have a healthy respect. That's what we're talking about here in a very silly way. I want to give you a couple of examples when you can really see this fear of God come over some biblical characters. In the book of Isaiah, Isaiah has the opportunity to have a vision of the throne room of God's grace and make note that those heavenly beings are saying, holy, holy, holy. And when Isaiah sees the full glory of God, a fear comes over him. He covers his face and says, I am a man of unclean lips. In Luke chapter 5, verse 4 through 8, after Jesus caused a miraculous catch of fish, Peter comes up to Jesus, falls on his knees, and Peter says, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. And then into Revelation, when John is writing that final book in our New Testament, all the other disciples are gone. John hasn't seen Jesus for 30 years, and he's having this vision of heaven, recording what he sees, and he hears a voice behind him, and he turns to look, and it's the risen Lord. And Jesus has a different appearance than he's had before. And all around Jesus, heaven is saying, holy, holy, holy. And John describes himself as falling with his face to the ground before the glory of Jesus. That's fear of God. We took our kids to Disneyland and our daughter, Jill, the one who tried to save me in the swimming pool, she was about four years old and she was obsessed with Goofy. The child would not rest until she had a face-to-face -face with Goofy. We hunted all day. We finally find Goofy. And I don't know if you've ever seen Goofy at Disneyland or Disney World. He's very tall. And then the hat makes him even taller. We put Jill face-to-face -face with Goofy. The picture we have is our Jill with her head on Goofy's feet. It was like she walked up to the glory that was goofy. She just fell on her face. Oh, oh, she just couldn't take it. That's what we're talking about here. 
that we are so overwhelmed with all that God is that it just takes our breath away and we can't help but just fall before him. One of my favorite definitions of the fear of God is an understanding of the gap. The gap between a sinful humanity and a holy God. Well, why does God deserve to be feared? Verse 2 indicates that he is unrivaled king over all the earth. Four times in this psalm, in verse 2 and then verse 7, 8, and 9, it is declared that God is the king over all the nations of the world. Everyone and everything are under his rule, whether they acknowledge his absolute authority or not, although they are invited to. We can never forget the missional nature of the book of Psalms. Anytime you see peoples, anytime you see nations, that is the inclusion of all people. And God wants to be the king over all people. Verse 3 tells us he should be feared because there are none who can compete with his divine authority. Earthly kings may have some authority. Earthly governments may have some authority, but it is limited. God's authority is absolute and unhindered. And one of the examples that this psalmist gives is how God defeated the Canaanites and gave that land to Israel as he had promised he would do back with Abraham, reiterated with Isaac, and reestablished with Jacob. Another reason he's to be feared in verse 8, it says that God has gone up to sit on his holy throne. It's a repeated theme of what we saw from the previous psalm. God has ascended victoriously to his throne to rule over heaven and earth. So what's the result of that? In verse 1 of this chapter, it says, With joy, peoples will clap their hands. Now, I did a little word study on that. And when we think of clap our hands, we think of individually. This is actually more like people clapping their hands in agreement. Maybe a high five that people are coming together, the peoples and the nations saying, our God is king, our God is undisputed. That's, that's really a more accurate portrayal of what's going on in this verse, that the nations will come together in agreement to praise the God of Israel. Awed by a king, when we have that, we fear him. Here's the third thing. When we are awed by the king, we trust him. We'll be looking at Psalms 93. So you may want to stop the video and just quickly go through and read Psalms 93. So the description to get us going, God is enthroned in the heavens, exerting his will and exercising rule over everything and the attire of kings that set them apart and indicated their high office is mentioned again. This Psalm describes God as robed in majesty. And the kind of robes that are being depicted are the regal garments worn by a victorious warrior king after a, deci after a decisive battle. God's unique characteristics are so intrinsic to him, it's as if he wears them. The previous story, important God, important God. It's said here again in this psalm. So when we are awed by a king, we glorify him, we fear him, and with this psalm, we trust him. Why can we trust him? Well, according to this psalm, he reigns for eternity, past, present, and future. The word reigns in the verb form here implies completed action or established condition. God, uncreated and without beginning, has eternally existed, always will eternally exist, and has the undisputed right to govern all that he has created. He reigns for eternity. He reigns over a kingdom that will not be shaken. And this is a theme that goes into the New Testament also. In Matthew chapter 16, when Jesus took his disciples to Caesarea Philippi, and he asked them, who do the people say that I am? And they said, some say you're Elijah, some Moses, some you're a prophet. And then he gets very personal. Who do you say I am? And Peter says, you are the Son of God. You are the Messiah. You are the Anointed One, the one who comes to take away the sins of the world. And Jesus says, upon this confession, this confession, this belief that I am the, the Messiah that has been promised by God the King, I will build my church. And he says, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. 
We live in a difficult time to be a believer in Jesus Christ. We need to remember that God has always and will always reign and reign and nothing can change that. The psalmist tries to give word picture to this. In verse three and four, he talks about floods and storms that come. Well, floods and storms were a Hebrew symbol of chaos and trouble. And so it's like he's envisioning these waters that are the opposition of the nations that are just pouring over the boundaries of what Israel was promised as their land. But the the roar of these waters was also representation of the moral disorder that was present in the world. So it's like there's this relentless pounding of waves that come against the beach or a woman who didn't make a good choice in a wave pool. The seas symbolize all that come against and oppose God's kingdom. Here's the deal. God is mightier than all of that chaos. In Matthew chapter 8 and Luke chapter 8, there's a moment when Jesus calms the storm and calms the waves and his disciples say, even the winds and the sea obey him. That's the kind of God that we're talking about enthroned in these Psalms. Just a little side note, in Revelation chapter 21, verse 1, it says there was no longer any sea. Let's tie that together with what we just learned. That's as if John is saying there is going to be God's complete victory over chaos and the complete removal of chaos. What a promise that's being made to us. God also reigns based on his word and on his character. God's words are spoken and they're sure never to be rescinded. We can count on these words. And his word stands firm because of his unchanging character. We must remember that God is in control no matter how things appear. Our present circumstances have no bearing on this fact. God can be trusted. Let's go to our next Psalm, Psalm 98. You may wanna stop and read Psalms 98. And here's our fourth point. When we are awed by the king, we celebrate him. Verse one of this chapter talks about, oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. And verse two says, the Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. There's that missional aspect of Psalms again. We have been called to celebrate with a new song in which God's salvation is proclaimed and his glory is declared to the nations, to the ends of the earth. That phrase is included in this psalm. Reminds me of Jesus' final words in Matthew chapter 28, where he says, go into all the earth. And in Psalms, or in Acts chapter one, verse eight, when it talks about Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. There's a song that we are supposed to sing and our new song should celebrate God's salvation for ourselves and for the nations. Jesus taught in Matthew 5:14 that we are a city on a hill. We believe God is great and therefore we should not ever limit the singing of that song. I'm not sure where I got this quote, but I think it's a beautiful one as it pertains to telling about our God. Evangelism is about adding worshipers to God's great choir. Our new song should celebrate God's wonderful works among the nations. His activity in human history is a testimony to the peoples on this planet. Our new song should celebrate his victory, past, present, and future. Past, he's done wonderful things on behalf of his people and behalf of the nations. And he's continuing to do marvelous things. No person is beyond God's saving power. No situation is beyond God's rescuing power. Part of the reason we believe today is because of his victories in the past. I see God's victories in the past. I believe him for victories in the present. And I anticipate those victories in the future. In verses seven through nine, this psalmist talks about God's judgment with righteousness and equity in the future. 
this should actually cause us to rejoice. I know when we hear words like judgment with righteousness, we think, oh no, here we go. What that's saying is as surely as God established the world, everything will be made right by him. And we can count on that. And let's go to the next Psalm. And this will be our last one, Psalms 99. You may want to stop the video and take a chance to read Psalm 99. Here's our last point. When we are awed by the King, we approach him. This Psalm focuses on God's residency in Zion. Now Zion is Jerusalem, it's the temple, it was built up on this mount, Mount Zion, and then you had to take steps up into the temple. So that's why there's this consistent theme in scripture about going up. There was physical Zion, which was Jerusalem and the temple, and then there's spiritual Zion that, that I can approach God because I am a temple of the Holy Spirit, which is, which is very deep theology there that we don't have time to go into. But what has happened because Jesus died on the cross for us is we should delight to approach God. We're allowed to approach God, even though he's holy, even though he's to be feared, even though he has all these unchanging qualities. It is, it was purchased for us to have this right to approach. Now, in approaching, we should approach with full awareness of God's holiness if you look in this psalm in verse 3, verse 5, and verse 9, it says, He is holy. And I want you to think in context of the temple. The closer you got to the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was in the first temple, the more holy the experience. And so you would come in and there would be the Gentile courts, and then the women's courts, and then the men's courts, and then the priest, and then there was that Holy of Holies, where the high priest could go one time a year to make sacrifices. There was an increasing level of holiness as the worshiper got closer to the presence of God. I do think that we may have lost a little bit of the this, of this sense of that. And I go back to the teaching on the fear of God. God's holiness implies consistency of character. We have to remember the polytheistic Canaanites who worshiped gods, they believed that those gods were fickle, they were changeable, and sometimes they could be downright nasty. So you made sacrifices to these pagan gods to appease them, to try to get them to not bring calamity on the people. Consistency of character was not expected, but since God is holy, we can approach him in prayer in the knowledge that his character is unchangingly consistent. Verse 1 says, let the peoples tremble, let the earth quake. The word tremble means to be deeply moved and even disturbed. And I like this quote, don't know where I heard it. A little bit of trembling would do us a whole lot of good. A little bit of trembling would do us a whole lot of good. So we should approach God with full awareness of his holiness. We should also approach him with full humility. Verse 5 talks about bowing in worship at his footstool. Well, footstools were a piece of furniture for resting your feet. I mean, we have an ottoman. It's basically the same concept. But the footstool at Bible times became a symbol for dominion. And kings carved their footstools with images of their enemies. Kings were portrayed with their feet on their enemies' heads as if the enemy was their footstool. All that taken together means that the footstool is a lowly position before him. We're not doing God any favors by approaching him. We're coming with the full knowledge of all that he is and the humility that that should cause in us because of the understanding of the gap. And those two make it sound like he's not approachable. We should approach him with full confidence. Verse 6 mentioned Moses and Aaron and Samuel and how they all called on God. And in his unchanging character, he answered them. In Hebrews 4, 14 through 16, it talks about Jesus as our great high priest. And part of those verses says we can approach with confidence through our intercessor, Jesus Christ, the great high priest. Think of it like this. Phil and I own this house that I'm sitting in, 
And Phil and I, we both have a key to this house because it's our house. We have full authority over our house. There are three other people in this world that have a key to this house. They're not on the deed. They're not making the house payment. They don't clean this house. They don't make sure this house is well stocked. But they can approach with full confidence. And it's my three grown children. Yes, they have their own places to live. But anytime they want to, they don't even have to call ahead. Anytime they want to, they can come and use their key to my house. Now, once they get in my house, there's still some rules that apply. There's still some respect that needs to be followed whenever they're in this home. But I am telling them, this is my house and you can come here anytime that you want. And one of the, the testimonies that my three grown children give to me is they talk about how well they sleep in my home. I mean, they slept good when they were teenagers. They still sleep good when they're here. And I can't help but think there's just something about being in your parents' house and knowing that you are loved and you are taken care of and that you're going to be protected. That's what the God of heaven, the sustainer of heaven and earth is offering to us. He is saying, you can approach me. Yes, I am the high sovereign king, but I want us to have a conversation. I want you to come to my word. I want you to come with other worshipers high-fiving about the wonderful, incredible God that we serve. So in review, when we are awed by our king, we glorify him. We give him his due. We fear him. We understand the gap. We trust him knowing that he can bring peace and strength to any circumstance. We celebrate him. We sing the new song of salvation and victory. Shout, clap your hands, sing, dance, and we approach him. The king of heaven and earth is watching and waiting for you to come through the front door. That's the end of Enthronement Psalms. You may want to spend some time going back over those psalms, getting out some extra resources, just reading through them, looking for common themes, looking for words you don't know, using resources to look those up so you can really get the full measure of what these Enthronement Psalms hold for us. I use this as our first segment after the introductory segment because if we don't get this right, that he is the sovereign king, the rest of it might not really make sense to us. The rest of us, we might not, the rest of these Psalms, we might not want to apply them. So that's why I chose to start here. We have to solve this, that God is the sovereign king and ruler who wants us to glorify him, fear him, trust him, celebrate him, and approach him. I hope you'll come back for the next segment next week. It will be on the wisdom Psalms when we will be instructed by the Almighty. Real truth from a real book applied to real life. Thanks for watching.